Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to the 2023 Hepatitis B Foundation Bruch Blumberg Seminar. Um, Sherry Cohen, I'm the president. I'm stuck behind a very tall microphone. Um, I'm the very short president of the Hepatitis B Foundation. And I'm very happy to be here today and welcome you. Thanks to everyone in the room and thanks to all of the folks online today. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so don't say anything you don't want people to hear forever. Um, the Ruth Blumberg Prize is the Hepatitis B Foundation's highest honor. And we give it the, we give the prize every year to someone who um, has done outstanding and extraordinary work and has made significant contributions to the field of Hepatitis B, Hepatitis D, or liver cancer. The Blumberg Prize is, of course, named for Dr. Bruce Blumberg, who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the virus and who was an integral part of the Hepatitis B Foundation until he died in 2011. Um, and this is our way of honoring Dr. Blumberg and all of the people who are doing outstanding work in Hepatitis B. We do have other Blumberg Prize with us today in the room. We have Dr. Harvey Alter. We have Dr. John Taylor. We have Dr. Christoph Seeger is here. Um, and I also want to point out some other folks Tim, Dr. Timothy Block and Joan Block are here also, co-founders and past president and um, executive director of the Hepatitis B Foundation and Ruth Blumberg Institute. Um, also with us, Dr. Randy Heyer, who is the current president of the Blumberg Institute, Dr. Ju Tao Guo, who is the executive vice president of the Blumberg Institute, um, and Dr. Lou Costa, who's just outside, uh, unfortunately taking an emergency meeting, who is the CEO of all three of our organizations. With that, I am very happy to hand it over to Dr. Guo, who is going to be introducing our speaker and award winner today. Congratulations, Stefan. Thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, Stefan is an old friend in the hepatitis field. So he, uh, he gets his uh, uh, diploma in biochemistry in Tubing University and uh, did his, uh, uh, get his PhD from uh, Max Planck uh, Institute uh, of Biochemistry. And then he joins uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hans Scheller's uh, group in the University of Heidelberg. And uh, since there, uh, uh, you know, he made a similar contribution in the hepatitis B research and started with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, in investigate the HBV and HDV interaction with uh, uh, hepatocytes. And, uh, uh, you know, his uh, uh, major, uh, I, I think that was his major uh, contributor for the first ever reliable HPV infection cell culture system with that differentiated, uh, uh, you know, hyper G cells. So with that system, so he was able to discover uh, HPV uh, press uh, region in terminal uh, well, first, uh, 47 amino acid peptides have a strong inhibition of the HBV entry and HDV entry. And then he collaborates with, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Mor uh, Morris lab that's at that time is a newly developed uh, UPSG, the mice model, and uh, quickly demonstrates uh, such a, uh, you know, potent in vivo uh, you know, inhibition of the HBV and the H, uh, uh, HDV infection. It's take another 12 years, go through the uh, preclinical and the clinical development, and uh, finally was uh, uh, based on the phase two uh, clinical data was approved as the first uh, ever HDV drug uh, in the Europe. And uh, the uh, drug was later on acquired by Elite Sciences. Now is uh, 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 intend to approve the in US. So besides this uh, uh, great contribution in the uh, uh, drug discovery and development, so Stephen have made a similar contribution to our understanding the HBV and HDV infection. I just uh, highlight a few. The first that's uh, uh, you know this uh, peptides that later on become a drug that actually also is a very important chemical proof to understand the HBV infection and that actually play a key role in the discovery of the HBV receptor. And uh, recent years, that's uh, uh, 
Stefan have made a, a very uh, important contribution to our understanding of HDV molecular biology, and especially the uh, inlet mute activation, and also the amazing things that uh, in the film treatment purge uh, the HDV, HDV completely during the cell division. That is a really amazing uh, discovery. So uh, based on all this, uh, his, uh, you know, uh, outstanding discovery. He has been recognized by numerous uh, awards. One is the uh, German uh, uh, Center for Infectious Disease Research uh, Prize. Another one, uh, that was in uh, 2011. And then later on was the uh, uh, Handkoff Foundation, Handkoff uh, 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 Prize. And I remember that was two years, uh, two years ago, that was uh, uh, awarded uh, uh, Outstanding Achievement Award by the International HPV uh, Meeting. So now today, I think that uh, he really uh, deserves that the uh, Blomberg Prize. The team always say, uh, says this is uh, the Nobel Prize for the hepatitis B research. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Let's just welcome uh, Stefan to uh, deliver his uh, seminar. Thank you very much, Utao, for that kind introduction. He already mentioned everything that I want to tell you, so I can make it very short. It'll probably take some time, but I'll give you some background information as I would like to tell you was a little bit, bit of the insights that we you know, give you some of the insights of the historic development of that drug because it was never intended to develop a drug when I started my work. Um, and I call it a remarkable drug because what we are doing, we are using a kind of natural product. It's also uh, not the way that normally a drug is developed by screening. We just took the advantage of the evolution of that virus in adapting through millions of years to its receptor and then make a kind of dominant negative uh, peptide that interferes with that receptor. So we beat the virus with its own tools. Now let's start a little bit with history. So you may know Hippocrates, of course, the father of modern medicine. He has published a kind of 70 papers, as we would call it today, which is the Corpus Hippocraticus about the healthy lifestyle. And um, this publication already made a relation between jaundice and liver diseases because hardening of the liver was associated with a yellow skin color. And epidemic, yeah, epidemic jaundice is known since the antique. Now, when I was young, I used to dive and sometimes I went to the Maldives and uh, in the Maldives, there is a stem. And this stem I used to, which, which represents, as you all know, Baruch Bloomberg, I mean, I don't wanna, carry oils into Athens. Um, um, and and Barupum, I used that stamp um, to tell my students about the hepatitis B virus Australia antigen discovery. But I never saw a real picture of him until I met him occasionally in a Hawaii meeting. But usually, as it is, if you do not print on both sides of your name tag, the name tag was vice versa. So I couldn't see the guy that I was talking to in a coffee, but he had to wear a hat and he was about going to the volcano. So of course he wanted, and he didn't want to follow the meeting anymore. And I thought, I know that face. And I remember that face. And actually it was Bloomberg that was the, uh, when I met him. Yeah, And as you all know, he was a physician, an anthropologist, a geneticist at the Institute of Cancer, got the Nobel prize together with uh, Daniel Gaidusek for the discovery of new mechanisms in the development and spread of infectious diseases. And as you know, and how there was, of course, with that uh, development, yeah, they make a diffusion test and looked for antigens for proteins in the serum of patients or, or not patients, et ethnical groups, yeah, in order to find some polymorphism there. And there was a German a lady involved in the final finding, Barbara Werner, I don't know whether you know them, know her. I mean, she occasionally handled the samples and she has a negative control and suddenly she became Australia antigen positive and obviously, not obviously, but also developed hepatitis and that then leads to the 
uh, discovery and it's beautiful to have that cabinet outside to see all this stuff, also the autobiography uh, uh, of, of Baruch Bloomberg. Now let's start a little bit with uh, the real viruses that we're talking about, hepatitis B virus, you all know. Um, 240 million people chronically infected, <clears throat> 650,000 die each year, although we have efficient vaccines. So the early vaccines were also, of course, uh, produced from the antigen and later on then from the, uh, from the recombinant protein, high areas of endemicity, Southeast Asia, Africa, and mother-to-child transmission is very important there. Entry inhibition could, call, could play a role there because immunoglobulins that you give to prevent is also an entry inhibitor working here. And then we have uh, an early vaccination, of course, within the first 24 hours. And then there was the discovery of Mario Rizzetto in the 70s, who discovered an additional antigen that he called Delta antigen, was initially thought that this is a antigen of hepatitis B virus, but later on came out that it is, it is, a, uh, it is a virus that depends, an independent virus that depends on the health Health function of hepatitis B virus. And there are areas of high endemicity that we already know, Pacific Islands, Mongolia, Turkey, Russia, but we do not have very good epidemiological data. So it's not quite sure whether these are uh, at least 12 million or even more, and we have to identify them and get better, uh, immun uh, better epidemiological data. Now, these are pictures of the serum of an enriched serum for virions. And as you all know, we have the Dane particles, the infectious virion. We have the subviral particles, the filaments and the spheres, which are S antigen or represent most of the S antigen that we find in the patient. But they are not infectious. They're just made by the cell and they are self-assembly competent even without the nuclear capsid and occasionally package the nuclear capsid. And we know now better structures, and this is a paper that we've done, uh, where we think that there is a very, very tight interaction of the nuclear capsids with some parts of the envelope proteins, which we unfortunately could not resolve in molecular detail. But we know that this is also the Brias domain that is inside here making contacts to the, uh, to, the, to the core dimers here. So the idea is that the capsid of the virus can independently form and then can arrange the envelope very tightly that's different from other viruses like HIV, where you have a lot of additional proteins in um, and flexibility. And this has also consequences, you think, for the entry of the virus into the pathocyte and also for the fusion process, because it's obviously something uh, that is not working uh, like it works for, for other viruses. Now, one of the curious things is this envelope during evolution was not always there. So recently we had the discovery for viruses that do not encode an envelope. And this is here is the hepatitis B virus. You all know that, probably most of you know that, the polymerase. And we have here completely overlapping with the polymerase, the PRIAS1, PRIAS2, S, the envelope proteins that are encoded here. We have the core, we have the E antigen, and we have an X antigen, but we found viruses they do not encode an envelope protein, but they have the same organization. They have DR1, DR2 replicate by the same pathway, reverse transcription, et cetera. And where, this, this virus, where do these viruses come from? They come from fish. This is a chitlet from Lake Tanzania in Zambia, or just not around the corner, but it's at the other side of the country. You have the rockfish. They also have this kind of arrangement. So we have to assume that these viruses that are also found in other Animals, woodchucks, they were very important. Bill Mason's work and Jesse Summers' work on duck hepatitis B virus, something I will talk about later on a little bit. Um, these viruses were capsids, they were naked, they did not have an envelope yet. So they have nothing to do with hepatitis, probably. They are, have a different uh, way of entering the cells and replicate in that same uh, manner. Now, Let's go to the B and the D and their interdependence. Um, you have here the enveloped B capsid with the double strand DNA, and you have the Delta uh, virus that has a uh, circular RNA enveloped in the same envelope proteins of the virus. So the helper function that the B virus provides to the Delta 
is providing the envelope protein for letting that virus enter a hepatocyte in probably the same manner. The virus replicate completely differently in their replication mechanism, and that is a reason why, for example, uh, drugs that have been evolved towards the uh, reverse transcription of the HPV uh, polymerase do not act on delta. But there are other common themes beside the common entry pathway that, as you already see, depicted as heparin sulfate and NTCP. I talk about that later. But both have, and that's also important to stress, they uh, establish episomes and do not integrate in order to replicate. HPV integrates, but not for replication, maybe for, for, uh, uh, for expressing the envelope proteins in addition to the CCC DNA. So this is the episomal form of the HPV. And this is sometimes that I sometimes call CCC RNA, what the hepatitis delta virus is doing. So that is important with the therapeutic perspective because it's maybe easier to remove an episome from a cell than to remove an integrate. And therefore, I think that's what, at least one argument that entry needed to play a, uh, an important role. Also, uh, uh, we have to regard that these episomes are, have different stabilities during cell division, et cetera. Yeah? So there is vulnerability at that point that is not given in the, uh, in the HIV. So, and what's important is, of course, that this formation of these episomes can be efficiently blocked by an entry inhibitor like Heplodex or Bulivertide. Uh, just to summarize how we think that this entry of these both viruses act is the uh, diffusion or uh, 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 penetration through the endothelial cells, the penetrated endothelium, that's the hepatocyte, um, the space of this here. And what we know is that both viruses need interaction with heparin sulfate proteoglycans via the S antigenic loop. If this interaction is not given, the virus cannot infect the cell. An NTCP expressing cell that doesn't have heparin sulfate proteoglycans cannot be infected. So this is a prerequisite, this attachment. And then we have probably very close to the membrane an envelope rearrangement that releases the receptor binding side of the virus that we think is hidden still in the membrane of the virus and cannot directly and fast bind to the NTCP receptor. That happens close in the membrane. And you know that we know now come to that later on, the receptor, which is an integral membrane protein, that is the NTCP, the sodium tauropolate co-transporting polypeptide, discovered by Ben Hui's lab. Um, and here are interaction side of that pre-S with the NTCPs. That this interaction works within the membrane property. I don't think that this receptor is just an attachment receptor. This receptor is a machine that probably provides also the energy through a gradient, that's a hypothesis, uh, through a gradient, to drive the fusion because we're lacking a real fusion protein here. But now let's jump how that whole uh, story began, what we now know, to 1996 when I became a postdoc in Ryan Schaller's lab. And at that time, already mentioned Jesse Summers, ducks play a very important role because we were lacking an uh, 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 infection system. And um, you see here the transplantation of brains uh, between ducks, we did different kind of experiments, uh, <laughs> but I, I took that as an example. So, for the, and so actually what we've done is uh, not transplantation of brains, but we had a flock of ducklings in a village um, outside Heidelberg. And these ducklings were used regularly uh, for preparing primary duck hepatocytes because that was the system that we can use for, uh, for infection. And this is Heinz Schaller, who brought me to this, uh, say, poultry research. He didn't like that expression. Um, and I have to admit, um, it was not an easy task to, to convince later on in your career, uh, medical faculty, that you're working on a duck virus and that has that <laughs> some relevance for you and bring them to prolong your contract. That was another problem. <laughs> but here you can see uh, me <laughs> when I was young. Um, and uh, this was Heinz. So this is Ula Brotza, you might know, Mark is now uh, also there. There were some people that are still active in that field. So what we've done here, we were asking the following question. It was an easy question. We should, and we should still ask ourselves that question for HPV. Why does this huge excess of subviral particles that I showed you, the Australia antigen for duck, yeah, 
Why does that not interfere with the infection of the virus if it's in a 10,000 fold ex ex excess? It has the same envelope proteins. I already, so I started to prepare the subviral particles, put the duct hepatitis B virus, and I put the recombinant Gries proteins of that virus on the primary duct hepatocytes. And what we found is that this pre S domain of the virus, unfortunately, I, I show you later on the, the, the pre S in a, a, in a scheme, um, that they can specifically inhibit DHPV infection. And if you use a human, a, HP, a human HPV pre S protein, this cannot. So we have the first hint of a pre S specific, so, so the species specific inhibitory process on the entry of these viruses. And of course, at that time, it was not intended to, 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 this, to, to, to develop a drug, as I already said, it was intended to find a receptor for the duct hepatitis B virus, because we thought that the homologous protein in HPV would be the HPV receptor. And um, this was my first meeting called Spring Harbor, uh, or from Gallup, you know, Jesse Summers uh, made were the session chairs, and uh, I had my first talk here, yeah. And we were describing that work of the infection inhibition assay. I was talking about a delicate interaction of an extended pre S subdomain within the time unknown DHPV receptor. Discussed a long time whether I have to use, I can use delicate as an expression with my father, he didn't like that at all. Um, and then we showed that the heroin hepatitis B virus competes DHP back infection as well, although it has only 48% homology. And um, we have to explain that. And the human did not. And the subviral particles did also not interfere with infection at low concentration, which was an indication that this is covered in the membrane, the, the receptor. And we thought, thought an accurate 3D structure is required for that interaction. I would have liked to show you the crystal structure of that complex, because we recently solved the crystal structure of that complex, which is very interesting, because the previous domain, I just show you, the previous domain is rearranged in interaction with the receptor, and this rearrangement induces a trimerization. So the whole idea that I already mentioned in this receptor interaction is that receptor interaction per se induces structural changes in the envelope in order to make a fusion competent complex. Just don't have time to show you that. Just want to go, what have we then identified? So with this approach, and also together with a group of Don Gannon who worked on that, and there was also Xu Ping Chong involved, um, we identified and characterized the carboxyphepatase D as an essential receptor for avian hepatoviruses. So we could express in the carboxyphepatase D, make a soluble form, for example, of that uh, molecule. And if you, for example, put that soluble form onto uh, uh, DHBV particles, you see the following. Here you see l protein staining, envelope protein staining by immunogold and the surface of these particles and the distribution, you can even count the l proteins on the surface of the dark particle. And if you add the soluble receptor, all these proteins go to one side of the virus. So this is the indication that you get a trimerization and you get a kind of receptor complex at one side. This was published in Journal of Virology. Later on, 20 years later, in HIV that has been shown as well was Nature paper, of course, but nobody was interested so much in this stuck uh, thing. But then we can also very nicely show the interaction of this receptor with the virus, surface plasma resonance, and biochemistry, as you heard there. Yeah. Of course, I wanted to go for that. It was not so interesting for the virologists, but I liked it very much. Um, and so this is now the pre S domain again, and this is the receptor binding site. And we could also, and that was important, we could also identify that within that large envelope protein, this N terminal part with this membrane part is also quite, in, in fact, quite active in infection inhibition uh, uh, of the DHPV and also the heron virus. So that is the duck version of nucleobase. And the duck version worked in vivo. You could show that, that if you treat the duck with these little peptides, you can prevent the infection of the duck. So the idea of the peptide inhibition was born, but the idea was is the carboxypeptidase of HPV, uh, uh, carboxypeptidase 
of humans, the HPV receptor, and the answer is no, that took me a year. Yeah, so I made all kinds of experiments, tried to proper HPV doesn't bind to human carboxypeptase. We have to clone that, cannot order that at that time. Antibodies had to be rise, no neutralization, no neutralization of antibodies to HPV infection. Human carboxypeptase doesn't render HEP2 cells susceptible to HPV and HPV that everybody's using now with the NTCP transgenic cell line soluble. Uh, carboxypeptidase does not inhibit re receptor. This is Urban Sina Ale, just sitting in the lab making these experiments, will never be published, but I'll just tell you now as a kind of historic side effect of a year. Okay, let's go to HDV because that was very important now to transfer that approach to the human hepatitis B virus because we had already the peptide synthesized with negative controls for the stuff experiments, yeah, but we didn't have a system. That was a problem. Just summarizing here again, the L protein as the four transmembrane domains, the PRIAS2, the PRIAS1, the MERS deletion. And there was a lot of work that has been done in France at that time. And many people doubt that the infection system, primarily in public life, was working accurately because it was polyethylene, polyethylene, and so on. Um, but it was became more and more clear. We have here attachment and fusion in the antigenic loop and also heparin sulfate protein interaction. But this myristylation is required. If you mutate the myristylation site, also in Tuck or in Butchuk, that doesn't work anymore. The integrity of this N terminal 75 amino acids is important. Whenever you introduce a deletion or something else, uh, an, an insertion, uh, it's not working. So the virus loses its infectivity. Has later been also shown in John Taylor that uh, I think that the, uh, no, this was Camille, so I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, that, 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 that is the same, the same for HD. Yeah? And the antigenic loop is uh, required for NTCP interaction. Now, when we, when we were in Amherst, 2001, maybe some of you remember that, um, we had the first two talks. And the first two talks was by Philippe Crepon, who worked on the human primary human hepatocytes, and um, which we used at that time for making the infection inhibition experiment and uh, the, 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 the receptor, uh, the, the peptides, the, the PS-derived peptides. And what we presented here first was we presented the HEPA RG cell line, <coughs> the first infection system for human hepatitis B virus. And we applied that for these <coughs> peptides. And we showed that these n related peptides derived from the PS domains of HPV block infection in a species-specific manner, and that this addresses a host-discriminating cellular factor which is different from the carboxypeptides. And one thing I wanted to stress when I look at these old abstracts here, <coughs> we had a high potency of these peptides, and we already wrote in last sentence, although you can now argue that anybody wrote something like that in the last <laughs> sentence, but uh, we wrote, they further lay the ground for the development of a new class of hepatomaviral entry inhibitors, that may be useful for future therapeutic purposes, uh, approaches. Now in 2005, now that was the time when we really decided they were highly active, picomotor concentration that we decided to uh, bring them into a development. We, we were not sure whether we still use the peptides per se or we make, make peptidomimetics or something like that. Yeah, there were other approaches. John had one approach, uh, uh, um, for, 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 for changing these. And, uh, but we had to go, of course, to the preclinical work. And one of these was, as we already mentioned, the mouse model with Maura. And what I wanted to stress here is that this has been then presented at the molecular biology meeting in Heidelberg that I was uh, organizing, co organizing with Tim. And it was the first time that, uh, that Tim and I met. I uh, not only met, but we have to co organize all meetings. Yeah, and this is a picture, unfortunately, the only picture where you see me but or Tim, but you should see Tim. Yeah, but this is Tim from uh, in 2005. Okay, anyway, so it's more about the science here. Okay, so we use this Yupa skip mouse model. So mouse that have a human liver, humanized liver, yeah, and we successfully applied these peptides in advance, so in a, in a kind of prevention setting, yeah. And we saw a complete blockade of the establishment of the HPV infection at very low doses. So already at 0.2 milligram per kilogram, there was no infection or mouse were completely protected. 
Until now, we do not even know the exact concentration that we need for blockade that. And we had a first hint that these peptides um, are hepatotropic, that when, wherever you put them in subcutaneously or uh, intravenously, they go to the liver like the virus is doing. And also here it remains an open question if efficient enter inhibition in combination with established therapy that reduce the number of infected cells. For us, it was very clear that we have to reduce in parallel the number of infected cells can improve the outcome in chronically infected patients. Okay, with that, I could convince, uh, at least in part, uh, my organization, University Hospital, to provide space, and they provided 38 square meters and a huge campus for 10 people, <laughs> which are tested an adequate awareness of the institution of the relevance of the project, and I could have got a prolongation of the contract, which was good. Um, this, by the way, is a goose, not a duck, that was a present from Peter Hans Hochheiler, my former uh, PhD father, who I shall on occasion his 60th birthday. And this was the group, the first group, more or less. And institutional investments are very important. But private investments are also important, <laughs> especially not only during the early steps of the hepatomavirus infection, but also during the whole procedure. So this was in my home. These were the people that were involved. We were already discussing uh, all the time. And some of these guys spent nights in the lab uh, for doing that. And of course, because I come from Palatinate, the wine was involved and uh, <laughs> it helps, uh, at least my experience. Maybe in some cases, it does not help very much. And of course, when we were in, when we were on the track of making the drug, we need a name for the drug. Yeah? I mean, some companies are doing nothing else but inventing names. This here is the original paper from Stefan Seitz, that's the guy, by the way, who described the Nakedna virus, the native viruses, who was all, always there. And he sat the whole night and probably also had some um, modulators of brain thinking, yeah. And uh, here you can see Murtudex, that was the first time that was written down. And the Mur Pharmaceuticals was named after that. And I just take the joke and put that into a keyword note for any further publication. And it evolved in, without any additional stuff. So suddenly you find Murtudex in the internet and you find them as key uh, notes. And uh, that was the idea. We had other ideas, for example, for the cap Palatine market, Keverin, you don't understand it because you don't speak dialect, but maybe some French people, was, for example, uh, uh, something that we, or Ingonix, yeah, nothing goes in, yeah, uh, as a thing in Ingonix, uh, but hep, Heplock. But finally, we ended up with Cap Prudec because Prudec, there is a kind of a similar pronunciation to an antifungal. In Europe, that was the reason they didn't use you know, the or have to take source number. Okay, now the activity, now the mode of action. You see here the sequence. This is the result of at least 200 peptides that we analyzed with mutation. It's not just the previous region, it's a variation of that start and optimization uh, of, that, uh, of that truck, and that blocks. Any three of the viruses at about 80 picomolar IC15 primary human hepatocytes. This is the HPV infection inhibition. HDV infection inhibition is the same. And here you see an immunofluorescence in the hepatology cell culture system. And I already mentioned the targeting to the liver. I showed you a picture uh, soon. And as we now know, it's very highly specific inhibitor of NTCP and only residual binding to other viral acid transporters. That's very important. I think that if we go for an entry inhibitor, it should, it, it, it should really be selective to NTCP because otherwise you may get the problems uh, with any kind of uh, xenobiotic interaction and so on and so on. So this was a surprise that was done together with a close friend in the pharmaco, uh, uh, in the pharma pharmacology, the radiology. So we labeled that peptides and we injected this peptide um, into a rat. Um, radioactively labeled. And within five minutes, you see the liver of the rat lighting up. Nothing else lights up. This is a peptide with a point mutation in the myrtodex. The liver tropism is completely lost. Distribution via albumin. This is the bladder. Here you have the kidney. Yeah? Um, uh, this is the lung. And the liver is not stained. So the, the hepatotropic uh, peptide, very efficient. 
And this also, and the surprise was it worked in red. It also worked in mice. And it worked in cheetah dogs. So this is the dog, as you can see. And this is the injection site. Here is the standard. And here you see the liver. And this is 24 hours post subcutaneous injection. So we need some pharmacokinetic studies, of course. I have to say these dogs, I don't know whether they still live. So we did that in our lab, yeah? And we didn't, we, 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 we didn't sacrifice the dog. The dog later on was given to a poison to a PhD student, and they, they, they lived with the dog for the next 10 years. Yeah, and it was unconventional, not, not as industry does it. And then came a fairly surprise. And the surprise was because we had to use um, either rats for toxicity study or the cyanomorphous mongrel. And we had cyanomorphous monkeys in our lab in the radio, in the nuclear, nuclear medicine. And we injected that on a Sunday evening or night with the boss of the nuclear medicine. And that was the result from the cyanomorphous monkey. There is no enrichment of the peptide in the liver of the cyanomorphous monkey. These are just the standards. It's the thyroid, a little bit of iodine goes. That's the better. The, the, the peptide goes it, through the urine, it's, it's filtrated out in the cyanomorphous monkey. And we couldn't almost believe that because, uh, of course, we knew cyanomorphous monkey cannot be infected, but rats could also not be infected. But there was a difference in the uh, 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 in the affinity. Though, though evolutionary close to humans, the cyanomorphous lacked the functional HPV receptor. And when when Hui in the Janet Out paper published that paper, it came immediately clear that this arginines and the, uh, the, the, the glycine and the, and the glycine here um, is different in cyanomorphous and pig. Fixed hepatocyte also do not bind the peptide. And if you just mutate that, then you can make the cyanomorphous hepatocyte uh, uh, susceptible to HPV infection, which is now on the way for the, for the thing. But that was very interesting that this HG makes a huge difference in the polymorphism of the natural polymorphism of the receptor. Here I show you the specificity again. If you have that NPLGSID, that is the peptide. And this is the receptor binding site, essential. This is the liver tropism and 24 hours in the liver. And whenever you mutate one peptide or one amino acid here, you lose the hepatotropism and you lose the enrichment and the prolonged uh, association with the liver uh, by that. And you can make that in vitro. In a primary human hepatocyte, the primary rex hepatocytes, the peptide binds to the surface of the hepatocyte and stays there with a half lifetime of about 60 to 80 hours um, and is slowly uptaken but inactivates that receptor for a long time. And that is very important for the clinical efficacy. If you use a substrate, at that time you didn't know that NTCP is the, is the, is the Target. But if you use a bile acid, this is be uptaken within seconds. So what you need is something that irreversibly binds to the surface and inactivate this. And of course, the question was, what is the molecule that we address? And as all of you know, this was another, I would say, very great meeting in Shanghai 2013, when Wen Hui who received the Bloomberg Prize two years ago, described the sodium tauroculate proton supporting polypeptide as a functional receptor. We had two um, talks here, and we had also um, verified that finding. That we later we had an independent approach, but uh, it was clearly one what uh, what what changed the field completely. And this is an integral member transmembrane protein transport the bile salts back to the liver into enterohepatic pathway, and specifically binds that peptide. And uh, he took advantage, by the way, of the peptide to biochemically fish out that receptor by cross-linking with a very clever. Uh, a way of, of, of putting in the first finger. And what we then immediately also investigated whether the hepsudex inhibits bile salt transport. And the answer is yes, it inhibits the bile salt transport. But it's important to know that this is in about a 100 to 200 fold higher concentration. So the peptide inhibits a picomolar concentration or subnanomolar concentration, the entry of the virus but it needs 50 to 100 nanomolar to inhibit the bile as it transports. So we have a therapeutic window. Of course, the question is, why is that? The hypothesis is that the virus, the T virus needs a trimer of these molecules. 
that whenever you poison one of these three molecules, the virus cannot make it anymore. But that doesn't mean that you have to fill all, all pockets. That's something we have to prove in, in, in HPV. We've shown the trimer formation in the duct virus. And this is kind of final um, experiment where we again have the PEP rudex in the wild type, wild type in mice. And this is a controlled peptide where you have the algorithm binding, no enrichment in the liver. And if you knock out the NTCP in mice and give that protects, it's the same as you have a control peptide. So this is a very strong thing that this is the selected molecule that there was. Now, how did that work? Time-wise, 2001, we had um, all these investigations with the in vivo model, with the uh, inhibitory efficacy. We also looked for the binding and the pharmacokinetics. And then we got a grant in order to produce that drug from the ministry uh, and make also the, um, uh, the, uh, the toxicity studies in 2009. This is the first while, I still keep that on my desk. And in uh, the 27th of July in 2011, this was the first human being that had the injection of the drug. And of course, I was absolutely happy to have come to that stage of first in human application, and there was a low dosing. That time we didn't know what the receptor is, so we had to we had to fight with the uh, with the agency. How do we cope? What is the concentration that we start with? They have to lay in the intensive care station, yeah. And you started with the, with the doses where you cannot even detect it in mass spectroscopy in the serum, and then you have to to consider uh, can you go on and so. But finally, this. Uh, ended up with 20 milligrams and no signs of any toxicity. I was quite happy about that. And um, then came the receptor. And then we, uh, we also knew that we could target NTCP because there were some people discovered in parallel to that time that do not have a functional NTCP receptor per se by polymorphic changes. Polymorphic changes. Yeah. Now, I also wanted to tell a little bit on this money thing that, that comes along with that. Uh, I was quite happy here to get that grant, the big grant, it was about two and a half billion, uh, million, sorry. <laughs> no, no, in Germany, in Germany, you just divide by, let's say, 20 to 50, <laughs> if it was compared to the grant that you can get here. In the but anyway, we, had, we, we could synthesize the molecule, we had the success proof of principle, we had everything published, we had the preclinical data, the, the clinical trial protocol was filed, I had the stuff in the in the in the in the refrigerator, and then I wanted to uh, get the trial. We wanted to make the trial, yeah, another follow-up grant. And this is just to translate you, uh, that means Urbigas was used for some years in HIV without any success, and this is not very innovative. No, no money. Yeah. So this is a power of a red ewer that unfortunately was in field. I was of course aware of the Google of the of the T20 peptide, the n 4 bt in HIV developed by Roche and always wrote a whole page explaining the people that this is not T20 and it is a different mode of action and so, and they just ignored it there. So we really had a, a bad time at that time uh, to get more money. But finally we found with the German Center of Infectious Diseases, someone who was still interested and we could continue, although I lost of course the Technician and all everything that goes along this, uh, with the cutting of your money. Yeah. And uh, now I want to end off okay, in, in this part, show a little bit on the ideas on the clinical efficacy of polyvertide. So, the first thing is, of course, the question what's the use of an entry needle in a chronic infection? First of all, we're thinking of prevention, yeah? liver transplantation, prevention of the reinfection, etc. But I showed you that before, these episodes that I established underlie. As he says, they thought to some extent a dynamic replenishment by either an intracellular root in HPV, you call that the amplification of CCC DNA. It's questioned and investigated here as well to what extent that root occurs. And also, the, uh, the, 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 the RNA virus needs a resynthesis for the, uh, uh, for, for the RNA. And the, the big question is whether an extracellular root, extracellular root contributes. To the, uh, to, the, to the persistence of these episomes in the nucleus. And that, of course, is not easy to decide what happens in nature. And the answer to that is 
of course, if you use such a drug in a clinical trial uh, where you just block this extracellular loop. Now, this is the mutual two trial. We did other trials before. We did an HPV trial. I cannot go to, to detail that. That has not been published so far. And there is some efficacy in HPV as well. But these are the centers that were, were then involved in that trial, which is just recently, um, um, just recently because of endless reviews, <laughs> Um, uh, published in, in, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. And this trial, you probably all know, just shortly want to summarize, these were the 120 B and E antigen negative patients, 30 patients per arm, three doses of Mercutex for 24 weeks, and then a control arm where only nukes um, have been given. And we have, of course, looked whether there is interference of Mercutex and TDF pharmacologically before in a safety evaluation. And what was what the, the, the most impressive initial observation that we get in all three uh, arms, and this is the mean of the, uh, uh, of the 30 patients, all three very fast within four or five weeks decline of AOT level, which per se is remarkable because, I mean, we have not reduced the HDV RNA level in that, in that short time to, 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 a, to a huge extent. Yeah? But what we saw is that after cessation of the drug, the ALT uh, comes back. So obviously there is a reinfection going on when, uh, when you stop at 24 weeks and this demands for longer trial sets. Uh, and this was right in, uh, in about half of the patient that normalized the ALT levels. And uh, as you know, the Delta patients have higher ALT levels as uh, B patients normally. And this is the, um, the, 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 the HDV RNA decline in the three arms that uh, correlates uh, with the ALT level decline, and this is tenophobia arm. And in the 10 milligram group, we had a 2.7 log reduction within 24 weeks. And that means you have a 500 fold reduction of serum RNA level. So we're talking about serum RNA, not liver RNA. So, uh, and since the Merpodex, or since the Heprodex, sorry that I sometimes still call it Merpodex, the, the Heprodex cannot interfere with an established infection. So, if you put it on an infected cell, nothing happens. It has to do with the de novo infection of that cell. And the hypothesis, therefore, was if you see that in the serum, that we have during the time of rapid turnover within weeks of HDV infected hepatocytes. And another aspect, an interest, interesting aspect here was that um, the decline in these patients follow different kinetics. And the kinetics is approximately a zero order kinetics. So although the ALT normalized, the decline of virus still continues and it's not coming into a, into a balance. So it's likely half lifetime of the hepatocyte or the infected hepatocyte um, determines the slope of these curves and they are different in different patients. And on the basis of that, we calculated how long would it take just theoretically, yeah, until you have really very low doses, low doses, the definition was, I think, one virus per 10 liter of blood, if you treat for that. And we, are, we, are, we were ending up here with three years of treatment. That you, but I mean, this is calculation and we have to see uh, whether that holds true or not in a clinical trial. And for that, the MERS 301 study design on, on the basis of that, was designed. And this is really a trial that goes for five years. And that's the phase three that is now running. So we have a one arm where we have a delayed treatment, delayed for one year, and then two years, 10 milligram, then we have three years, 10 milligram, and then we have two, uh, three years, two milligram, and then we have a follow-up phase because we know that there is rebound after a longer time for two years. So that's the study design. And there are interim results now already presented because the study is somewhere here. In, in, in that range. And I show you now one part of the interim result that have been uh, presented on the liver samples that have been taken by those patients. They were ready to give uh, uh, the paired biopsy samples. And that uh, investigation has been done by uh, the Alvarez Maura Dunphy's lab. So we have 79 paired biopsies for delta antigen and cell count uh, studies. And we have 66 paired biopsies for HPV RNA, HPV RNA in the liver of that sample. And this here is the results 
So those patients that get a delayed treatment, so low treatment, yeah, so they, they, you see there is no change in the number of delta infected hepatocytes, which are shown here as these brownish dots. Yeah. Um, there is no change in the number of cells in, in these patients, or only one patient here. And this is the result of the uh, patients that have been treated with either two milligram polyvertide for one year or 10 milligram. And as you can see, we see, or we verify, or we at least have evidence that we really lose the number of infected hepatocytes in those cells. And if you correlate that, reduction of delta antigen positive cells with the reduction of liver RNA, delta RNA, uh, you also see the reduction of the RNA in those samples, and that correlated completely. So we really think we are losing cells uh, by that kind of monotherapy with, uh, uh, with Heptodex in those patients. Okay, that is now, of course, on the way and will tell us whether after two or three years we may have a sustained response. What I didn't tell you here is that we do not see any effect on S antigen. If you have a monotherapy, mono, uh, mono S antigen stays the same. And of course, some of you may ask the question, how can it work that on the one hand side, we lose delta infected cells and we don't lose S antigen, Later on, I, I, I know that you can. <laughs> but you lose S antigen, but also vice versa. We do not increase S antigen when we remove the drug. Yeah. So this is something we have to explain. But what I wanted to show you now um, is the results of another trial, which is another phase two trial, the MIR203, where we combined the MIRPIDEX with the PEG interferon. Pegulated interferon is occasionally used, but not approved for Delta. And I would like to show you the results, or only results of part of the trial. There have been sub trial with more concentration, and 10 milligram combination with PEC interferon, bulimatide alone. But this is the, the, the results I want to talk about. This is PEC interferon for one year, bulimatide for one year, so one year more than we had in the uh, 201 trial, and 5 milligram with PEC interferon and bulimatide uh, alone. So, and this is what we see. If we just look at the arm that gets Heptodex alone for a year, we see that there is a decline, 15 patients here, that's the median HDB RNA goes down, but still after a year, we have a rebound, mm -hmm. but the decline continues. This is the pegulated interferon treatment, monotherapy, where you see some effect, especially at the beginning, and then also a rebound later on. And now came the surprise when we combine these two drugs, then the following happens. So we have a much more profound decline of Delta virus RNA, and we have a sustained response at least in half of patients uh, after the removal of the drug. And interestingly, if you do that with five milligram, the sustained response is less pronounced. But what we get is a strong synergism of interferon alpha with Heptodex on HDB serum RNA levels at the end of treatment. This is here up to uh, five to six logs. And, and that, in addition, is that eight of the 50 peer patients remain delta RNA negative at week 72, so during the follow-up in the two milligram combination and less in the five milligram combination. I come to that later on. But what I want to go with you, because we, we, are, we are trying to understand, we are not only doing the clinical trial, we are trying to understand that synergism, because that's important for understanding how to interfere with delta in the future as well. And one of the things is, and the question was, how can we explain the therapeutic effect of interferon, the synergy? What we knew already by some experiments from uh, Maura, but also from our, is that there is, beside the spread of the virus via an extracellular route, so that, that the virus can come out and enters again, and you can inhibit that with lonafanib, the, the assembly, but also the entry with the bulimur type, there is the possibility that delta can spread by cell division. Yeah, so without any help of B, if it would be in the cell already, and there have been several things that have been overlooked by for a long time, it's independent of HPV, and uh, it's efficient when the proliferation <coughs> uh, capacity of hepatocyte is high. And the challenges of a curative therapy 
uh, that of course blocks uh, uh, challenges the curative, uh, curative therapy by just entering the different. And maybe we need therapeutically a combination. And of course, if we would have a therapy that addressed the both pathways, that would be crucial for the elimination. And our hypothesis was that the interferon, besides maybe doing just something on re, uh, reactivating the adaptive immune system, may have a direct action on the cell division mediated spread so that the interferon interferes with that mode of action. Now, show you three slides to, to what we found out here. The first thing is, this is a time course of an HDV infection uh, where you see up there two, day three, the red cells coming up with delta infection of our T cells. And in green, you see MX8. So uh, the, the induction of the interferon response by delta itself. So delta induces an interferon response differently from, uh, from HPV. And if you block that with an entry inhibitor, you see no induction of interferon uh, uh, response. So we need replication to do that, not that an oculum is doing that. The replication is doing that. Now we did the following experiment. We infected UH7 MTCP cells that can be infected with delta. You see the, the red dots here. And they are not able to produce interferon. They can react against interferon, but they cannot produce interferon. Then we split those cells one to 800 and let them grow. And what you see is you get huge colonies of delta infected cells in the absence of HPV just by cell division. That virus can spread in an interferon incompetent cell. If you use an interferon competent cell, like you have our G cell, you see that that, that spread is here, some cells still positive. Yeah, that spread is more than inhibited. So that speaks for a for an effect that the delta induced interferon response restricts, restricts the delta cell to cell division mediated spread of delta itself um, in such a cell. The next thing that we did is uh, we looked on, on the exogenous effect of interferon in this UH7 NTCP cell, uh, which, which can recognize interferon but cannot make a uh, response. So infected those cells. And then we treated them after splitting with interferon. This is the splitting. Or we put the interferon on the cells that cannot divide anymore. And this is the effect on the splitting, as I showed you. The interferon can then prevent the cell to cell mediated spread. And once you have the, 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 the infection established, nothing happens. So it only works when the cell divides. And obviously, an ISG induced by the interferon exogenously or endogenously can remove delta RNA, replicating delta RNA from, from that cell. And you can do that um, also in this innate immune competent HEPA RG cell. If you knock out the sensor for the delta, uh, which is the MDA5, so you can overcome that restriction if you knock out MDA5 in an interferon competent cell, or if you use a CHUK1-2 inhibitor, uh, uh, that, that blocks the ISG induction. Clinically, that would have the consequence that, for example, polymorphism in the sensor of the delta MDA5 or the use of uh, immune suppressors like, like Ruxolitinib may affect the delta replication in patients. Yeah? And blocking the interferon response promotes cell division mediated spread in the, in the delta cell. So, and this is our explanation for the, um, for the synergism of interferon plus, uh, uh, plus boulevard high uh, on the delta, uh, on the biological response. And I show you at the end of my talk, something that I personally found the most interesting observation in that thing in the trial, and that is what happens to HPS antigen in those patients. I already mentioned that the monotherapy with Merkudex, these are the individual patients of this 203 trial, doesn't show any change during therapy and no change of therapy. So no, nothing goes up and, uh, or, or goes down. And the same is also true, at least for these 15 patients in the interferon treatment. You know that some patients react against interferon, but this is not very many of them. And this also depends on the 
on, on how high is the, is the virological load. But that's what we observed in the combination arm on S antigen. And what you see is that in six out of 15 patients and two out of 15 in the five milligram combination, we had S antigen responses that were more than one log for HBS antigen negative deviation in the combination arms. And this is fast if it occurs. And in some patients just don't react and some patients react. And of course the question is how can that happen? And what goes along with that uh, uh, in that observation and of course, the question is, are there flares? Is there an uh, immunological uh, response involved? Unfortunately, we do not have the samples in that trial for making immunological studies, but this is, for example, uh, individual patients, this is ALT and this is S antigen. So they get a flare and during therapy, the flare disappears and then you have S antigen reduction or negativation. And in some of these patients, you have even anti-S antigen coming up. So S antigen elimination is presumably association with the restoration of the cellular immune response. And we have a functional cure in a subpopulation of this patient in this arm. So they are also, uh, they are also HPV uh, negative. I mean, they were on the xenophobia uh, anyway, um, but, but they are cured according to that. And of course, the big question is here, does that work in HPV mono infected patients as well? in the combination with, a, with an entry inhibitor. And of course, we have to explain what is the entry inhibitor doing here? What is the synergy? Is it, for example, just a speculation, is it, for example, the prevention of de novo antigen presentation? This is, of course, something that we do. We, we stop the de novo presentation of antigen. That may be a regulatory effect for restoration of the immune system. Does it have to do also with bile acid modulation? Because we know that bile acids have the immune modulatory effect in the liver. These are all the open questions that we should follow, of course, um, and we will do. Now, let's stop here, give you the summary where we are. We have the Petrodex approval in 2020 in Europe, acquirement of the Mill Pharmaceutical by, by Gilead. So Gilead submitted a BLA to the FDA in 2021. The FDA approval is still pending. There was a complete uh, response letter by FDA. They want to have improvement of manufacturing of, of uh, other things, but no additional clinical trials. So I hope we hope that there is a relatively fast decision once that is fixed. Yeah, and of course that will be fixed. And uh, I said the theoretical potential. Uh, will be will be seen in the mono study, uh, mono uh, study so not in the combination trial in the phase three study, but that will take until 2025 or six at least until we have that data. But we will of course uh, uh, follow up and report on that. And the question is, how can we explain the synergism of interferon polyvertide regarding the S antigen response? What's the role of bile acid? I already mentioned that in immune restoration, this combination. Um, with interferon, or not only interferon, we want to get rid of interferon, yeah, of course, yeah, but whether the other immune modulators that are developed now for HPV cured, you know, seven, you know, eight agonists, et cetera, uh, could, uh, uh, could um, complement the Mucrodex uh, uh, and induce HPS antigen zero conversion, and whether that works also in HPV mono infected patients um, as a curative treatment. Um, and would HPS antigen reduction prior to a treatment, for example, enhance the response? If you have looked carefully, you've seen that she of the four patients in the range of the thousand S antigen international unit reacted, and the higher the S antigen load is, the lower. And where we are now standing in the real world data, this is just a summary of all the abstracts that have been presented at the AASLD meeting. There was the German Center of Infectious Diseases being, for example, just to pick out some. Uh, there is a broad antiviral activity against all HDV genotypes, so we do not have a thing that, that different genotypes are not reacting. Um, then we had, for example, uh, it's shown here, of therapy cure of hepatitis delta after three years of polyvertide. People on that, people did already uh, compassion use studies many years ago. He started, and we had some patients that already received it for three years, and it stopped the treatment. And, uh, uh, and these patients did not relapse. So it, it's an uh, it's indication, but it's single patients, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you can 
also either the ASLD and unfortunately I forgot to put that in here in that slide. There is a recent review by people on that was that, that summarizes all the real world data on all the clinical data in a comprehensive manner. I just recommend you if you want to look more deeper into that um, uh, uh, into that uh, review that, that is putting everything together in bars and that's quite quite nice. So with that, I want to thank first of all. Um, uh, so historically, the people that were involved in that long uh, uh, journey that we had uh, in the pre studies, then I want to thank, of course, the patients, the clinicians that participated in the clinical trials. The whole thing was also embedded in the molecular virology of Bartenschlager. It was great to have that group together. Yeah? And uh, this is this vivid discussion. There was Alexander Alexandrov from the Mur who, who complemented the scientific part. I was never part of that company, but we, we cooperated very closely and it was very productive. Um, also with the Moscow Research Clinical Institute, Pavel and Pogolomov. That time, then the, uh, the clinicians here in Germany, Heiner Wegemeyer mostly, Michael Manns, and the competence that have attended. Maura was involved all the time, but then here, the pharmacokinetics, and that was the funding that we got uh, from uh, the government and several other. Um, uh, entities like uh, uh, like also DFG, EU, WHO, Landstuhl, and Park, Wittenberg, etc. So and with that, I just want to uh, end up with uh, so some people that I really owe a lot from the very beginning. These were my parents. Uh, these are the vineyards. I talked about the wine already, and already as a small. So this is uh, maybe the. Clothing was a little bit different at that time, yeah. Pixies, <laughs> but we were already used to go to the vineyards here, yeah. Unfortunately, I do not have a picture of my former chemistry teacher. He was great, he brought me to chemistry. You know, I was more the chemist. Peter Bola was uh, uh, in Tübingen, the one that brought me always brought literature together with the uh, uh, with, with the science. So he was a great teacher in biochemistry. Peter Hans Hofscheider, who did my PhD, Hans Schaller. Uh, and uh, uh, who, who unfortunately could not see the development anymore, but he always supported me in doing that. I mean, it was our fights, but uh, I mean, that was Heinz. Everybody who knows Heinz know that, yeah. Um, and this was Ralph, or uh, is Ralph, uh, we're living side by side. And this is not the only people that I want to thank, I want to thank these guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sometimes uh, uh, took me away from. All this scientific stuff, and that's also important as you can may see here. Some of you that is Rome, yeah, and uh, can spend nice days in Rome as well. Prior to that, and I would re even recommend that to travel more and more. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Urban. I just, on behalf of the Hepatitis B Foundation and the people that we serve, you know, we speak to thousands of people living with Hepatitis B and hundreds who live with Hepatitis Delta. And um, you've given hope to millions of people. We we hear from folks all the time about their interest and excitement and they can't wait to get the drug. So, um, yeah. so, so thank you for everything. At this time, I'd like to open it up to questions in the room first. Um, so feel free to ask your questions and- Thanks, Sharon. So um, I obviously, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much and all the work. I, I do have several questions, and I'll get at the first one. And I'll take. So, um, uh, so that was a remarkable effect of the combination of interferon and, and perclitic B. And then there's a narrow, kind of a narrow therapeutic rate window for uh, hepatitis, uh, where it's effective at two, five, and then falls off at ten. It makes me think. As you're obviously thinking that this peptide, this oligopeptide is doing something more. Is it doing anything more than just preventing the entry? You mentioned, for example, some effect on antigen presentation, the primary antigen presentation. But does, it, does it also do something on the egress? Does it work somewhere else in the cell, wherever NTCP is? Hmm. It will track it down inside the cell and prevent an interaction yeah. between virus. In principle, we cannot completely exclude something like that. But what we see in vitro and in all the experiments that we've done is, first of all, it does not do much on any other replication step of the virus. 
um, even at very high concentrations. So you also have to consider the concentration that you use. Yeah, many people use micromolars or something. This is just not necessary for blocking uh, the entry. And uh, there have been even some public publications that it, of course, may influence the de novo synthesis of NTCP because what you change right. is also the NTCP dynamics. Yeah, so all the regulatory stuff in the biases. So it's probably doing a lot of things. I, I guess, for example, microbiome will completely change of this, this, this these patients because if you change the bile acid uh, composition, yeah, you will have different uh, uh, different concentration of bile acids, and you will change the microbiome. I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, you will change the inflammatory response, and this could be, by the way, to the to the positive. Yeah, because if if you have higher bile acids, then in, in the serum you may have uh, less inflammatory responses, which could be the case. Yeah. We have to investigate that. You could use the mercury for cholestasis or something. So there are also other applications beside, beside that. Yeah. But to already know, we would not think, and of course, the de novo uh, synthesis of, of, uh, 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 of antigens, yeah? because that is a consequence of the. But you mentioned the primary. Uh, yeah, but the primary thing, thing is, is uh, I guess, the entry inhibition. And of course, the uh, the homeostasis of bile acids and the homeostasis of, of NTCP. Yeah. yeah. Is the way the peptide responses to the modified in vivo? The, the better, better process? Does the peptide get modified or processed in vivo? Ah, <laughs> that's a good question. So, in, in the natural, Environment, the LPOD and that uh, in these positions do not does not have a, a, a known processing, um, and the peptide we just don't know. We, we, what we what we think is that it is just degraded lysosomally, and then uh, but it is not a prerequisite for 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 the activity or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I got a puzzle. Uh, Camille Sorosha with the surface energy of one of the small, was it sufficient to package the RNA? Yeah. He went further than that and showed that just the envelope protein of hepatitis C virus is just as good as packaging yeah. Delta. Okay. Uh, cells that have integrated copies of like surface energy yeah. package Delta. But when you use the low protein treatment, the amount of virus goes down 500 fold. Does that mean that less than one in 500 of the particles are actually uh, empty particles? So, so first of all, we we, although we could not reproduce the, uh, and, and many people are trying to reproduce the packaging of delta in HCV envelopes. That's the first thing. Yeah? Okay. We've tried that very hard. We can package the delta into BSV G protein. That works. Okay. But, but it's independent of the uh, of the granulation of the large delta. So there is a possibility to package that in. Yeah. Yes. Um, and regarding. Your question, no, we think that, that you really lose cells that produce, and, and of course I agree. It goes down 500 fold. And, and you saw there's no infected cell anymore in the liver of these yeah. patients. So, and and um, and the pain, the, 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 of, of course you can package the delta into S only, yeah? But that must not be significant in the patients or it wouldn't have gone down? We, yes. But the point is, uh, it could well be that a part of the particles of the delta in the patient is not infectious because of several reasons. One is only packaged in S, and of course it can be packaged from an integrate. So if you have an integrate, if you make a cell line with an integrate of HPV DNA and you put delta in, you get delta out. No question, and you can even make S only to get delta out, it's not infectious. But why would the peptide reduce it by 100 fold? Yeah, because obviously, uh, obviously we, we, we affect we do not have, but yeah, we have to explain, for example, the non-responders. That could be one of the explanations for the non-responders, mm -hmm. yeah, that you just have producing cells like a 2 to 15 cell for delta in the liver of a patient mm -hmm. that just produces delta. I can even tell you a very weird idea. It's not weird, but it's a provocative idea. That could be a predictor for hepatocellular carcinoma. Imagine you would have a delta in a, in, in a, in a, uh, um, in, uh, in cells, cells that are proliferating uncontrolled and have S inhibition, they would just produce cells all the time. And they would not be sensitive at all to, uh, to the nucleus. And we can put the, the, the question vice versa. We can be very surprised that so many people react. Yes. 
profoundly, which tells us that, 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 that in those patients, you have a real Delta replication here. Thanks. That's how I would interpret the data of the non-responders because non-responders are not, not, not resistant. We know that already, I didn't tell that. Some non-responders that, that only have a small decline from Delta on the Bulli yes. side, it's not resistant against Bulli Virtual. So everything points that there is some productive pathway of Delta that is insensitive to the normal entry for replication. Yeah. No, I think the Chris was first. So let me make very clear your model for cure from Delta requires a hepatocyte kernel. Yeah. Either by the immune system or okay. just by the toxicity of the virus. So there should then be a very strong correlation between ALT or label cell death markers, whatever they might be, and the time period it takes to accomplish that cure. Do you know from these patients, do you have the ALT and label data to establish that correlation? This will be in that in that uh, in that trial. Yeah. So, okay, so you do have it, right? I mean, yeah, I do don't have them so, now. So my... Then what that goes back to is what we understand from the Wuchak model in terms of the cure for hepatitis B, which is you require dynamics, you require hepatocyte dynamics. Okay. Yeah. Need... All right. So, and, and your model and your data actually directly confirm this. And so then, what the data also show might predict this is that the half lives of delta and B are different, and that's why it might take a hundred years with that treatment until. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, it might take long, I'm just saying, because I don't know exactly what the half lives are, the delta RNA, and how it was established, but let's forget about it for the moment. Would you think that if you would? Produce hepatocytes in those livers that are now resistant to HPV, like, uh, for example, wouldn't have that polymorphism that you uh, mentioned in terms of the NPC uh, receptor. Would you think then that your combination of the two drugs would cure <laughs> chronic but, HPV? But the face and button. I would say if you would have a popular, I mean, depends on whether you really can repopulate the whole liver yeah, uh, from that part. But yes, I think that you have a better chance for curing. Well, the bunch of data clearly show that you can do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There goes yeah. Very yeah. yeah. But, but, but from a realistic point of view, what I think is very important, or what was critically discussed for any drug is. Uh, um, combination in HPV is whether you need a turnover of the parasite, whether you have to kill those cells. I personally think yes, because yeah. otherwise you will not get rid of the S antigen because you will have integrates. And we have even indication that those cells that express S antigen from an integrate are not actively replicating the virus. So they may not be core positive, <laughs> but they may spread and they may just islands of acetylene producing cells. To be provocative again, I would call that concept from the HPV virus like a kind of pro subvirus compared to the HIV. The HIV integrates in order to replicate. The HPV integrates part of its stuff, the double strand linear DNA, in order to produce a pool of acetylene positive cells because it helps the virus to some extent to circumvent the immune response, et cetera. Delta took advantage of that as antigen integrates, probably. I guess that the ma major replication space in chronic delta infected patients is not those cells that have CCC DNA, it's those cells that have the integrate. That's perfect for delta, perfect replication cell. You can even suppress HPV without having a disadvantage. Yeah? And especially if you, uh, for, for the envelope proteins, the envelope proteins, now I'll come again to the, I, I am allowed to speak with the virus, I hope. Um, the Nachetna viruses, which do not have an envelope protein, they can do their job without an envelope. So probably the envelope protein and the S antigen have not primarily evolved to envelop that virus, but they may have first evolved in a way of producing an S antigen, not even an L protein, or even to envelop the virus just to make subviral particles that have a function for that virus, for these Nachetna viruses, even without 
uh, being enveloped. That came maybe in a later step of evolution that you package the capsid, and then you evolve the different receptor binding sites. DHPV makes another receptor, Woodchuck makes another, HPV uses the, the NTCP. This could be the, 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 the idea, so the hypothesis. <laughs> I think you uh, Sorry, but oh, next. No, he gives you. Yeah, good. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> for the effects beyond uh, the uh, entry inhibition, uh, are they caused by the drug or possibly the drug metabolized? How the drug is metabolized? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What we think, I mean, that we think the binding of the drug to the NTCP is irreversible. We also think that the that it, it changes the um, the endocytosis of the NTCP in complex, but it will probably be endocytose and then lysosomally degraded. We have some indication that if you label the drug, yeah, um, that the label then comes out uh, in the bio. So it's it's probably uh, it's probably endocytosis and uh, just told you But the metabolized do you think it has some additional effects? Hmm. I mean, you have to see it's not much of that drug that you give. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, if you calculate from the IC50, it's, I mean, even this two milligram dose is way too high. So you could go down and we have some efficacy at 0.5 milligram. Mm -hmm. Now imagine 0.5 milligram of a peptide for a liver. This is really a, a crystal of sugar there yeah? from the mound. This is really, I, I, I see that not as something that is a, a, a drug that completely blocks or has to, to fish out all the molecules that it addresses. Yeah? It's, it's very efficient. It's like, like a, uh, yeah, in concentrations of hormones or something like that. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, first of all, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Very good. And we're going to let you keep the Bloomberg Prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I think about it. I take it. <laughs> As a clinician, you didn't mention anything about side effects. Yeah. Uh, my experience with interferon is that it's a terrible drug yeah. patient wise. Yeah. Uh, so, but does, does the Mercury X have a side effects on its own? And yes. this is exacerbated when it's combined with interferon. Yes, that is, of course, um, first of all, I didn't want to say that the synergism gives a therapeutic hint that you should use it, because all the data that we have now does not necessarily say that the combination in the final outcome is better. Oh. That's the first thing. You know, I personally would think this is not clarified yet, and I would tend that the monotherapy with polyvertide is the better alternative, a little bit longer, because a faster decline of the viral RNA is not associated with a better decline of the biochemical response. That's the, the interesting thing. So the biochemical response, ALT normally says, is faster if you do not have uh, if you do not have uh, the the polyvertide uh, in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so that yes, but. But I would only bring in the interferon if you really would come or we could verify this curative effect of both viruses as a, maybe a possibility as an interim solution or an option that you follow patients for a short time period because you saw within some weeks, so 10, 8, 12 weeks, you see a reaction. And maybe that then could be tried in France, for example, the doctors decide on their own whether they add interferon in the ATU program or not and follow the patient. That could be an option. And for me, it would be just the hint that if you would find a more specific way of inducing the still unknown pathway that the interferon is doing for Delta here, that that may be a future combination therapy for Delta, if you want to go for a cure. If you fail, if cure or monotherapy alone uh, would fail. Also, I would remind you to the following. Imagine we have, I showed you this clinical data with, with two drugs, that if you would investigate them in an established infection, wouldn't do anything. If you would use the cell culture system where no cell division works, 
And where an HPV infection is established already, and you give interferon plus polyvertide, you wouldn't see any therapeutic effect. This, this is funny if you compare that with what's happening to patients. Yeah? And I would think if you, we should go and we are going to that direction to find something, for example, a host factor that is required for Delta to replicate and would affect an ongoing replication in addition to those two. That could be a very good uh, combination. Yeah? And I mean, the Delta, as, Delta antigen as a target for modulating, for example, the pol 2 for replication, um, that would be a good idea. Or let's say a target of a ribosome. Nobody has, has a screen, the ribos, uh, small molecules that interfere with the two ribosomes of that. If you would add something like that and the bulliverdite, and maybe then something that would inhibit the cell to cell division, the, the cell division medium is spread. I think harder you cannot hit. But, but that could be an option. Yeah? The interferon is not the last thing, but I mean, many things also in the HPV new trials hint that interferon is doing something in combination better than it can do on its own. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think Chisha Farsi has shown that interferon alone can cure or ameliorate delta infection. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, the, the, the percentages. is. I wouldn't be very satisfied as a scientist, of course, as a doctor, if you have something that helps and people can, and you have to see, most of the Delta patients are advanced. They cannot, they cannot tolerate the interferon anymore. Most of the cirrhotic patients, we have, we have uh, 50% cirrhotic patients in that, 50% cirrhotic patients in that monotherapy. Yeah, and most of them cannot be treated with interferon anymore. Stephanie, before you step back, uh, what, Speaking of side effects and usage, practical usage of the drug, are there new formulations sustained? Because right yeah. now it requires. The, the I mean, the formulation subcutaneous injection um, is, of course, the, the only that we had at that time that would work right. efficiently for a peptide. We've tried to make it orally. Yeah. You can do some tricks in order to get 10% uh, because it's so potent. I thought. Yeah, uh, yes, but that has not been found. What I think what will be the, the, the near future is to make uh, on that pharmacokinetics yeah, that you see, to make a poly deposit where you inject once every two weeks or something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, until you have something, some variation that you can use orally. I could imagine that this is a that this is an option. Is it daily an injection for two years at this stage? An injection for for two years every week. every two years. No, for right. right. two years every day. Once no, in, at the moment it's indefinite. So it's, 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 it's once as long as how often? It is once a day. Once every day. day. Yeah, it is given once a day. day. All right. Yeah. Daily. And the compliance is, is quite high. So, so we don't have problems with compliance. So the Delta patients really take it because they see that, that it works. Yeah. So, yeah, what's the basis actually for knowing or not knowing the half-life of Delta RNA when it works? I mean, why, why do you know what, what the half-life is in the absence of having actually an inhibitor of replication that like in the case of HPV, where you can use it off the and then they have CCC DNA. How, how do you know that without amplification, what the half life is of the RNA? Yeah, you can say, and then Jim, you ask for the half life of an established cell or the dividing cell. Jen Hong, ex Jen Hong Chang expressed delta RNA, no DNA, in cells for, for two years in a, in a, with a low level of delta energy. If yeah. there's no antigen, it wouldn't survive. If you increase the antigen 20 fold, the cells go into cell cycle already. Mm. Okay, all right. But to, to, to make it even more complicated, and what would you think? We, we also have evidence that you may have silenced delta RNA in a cell. Silence. Silence, yeah. Because, I mean, you know, this, this different distribution. Once you have a replicating cell, it produces delta antigen in real high amounts that you can easily detect in the, in the nucleus, but you have some uh, indications that, uh, that if you have large delta antigen expressed, yeah, granulated, that it inhibits and it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't start replicating. 
And uh, this is another problem that you may face that you cannot get rid of a silence RNA that may be reactivated after some time. But this is also something. The lab is a potent endeavor, it's no yeah. question. Yeah. So I, I know we need to wrap up quickly. Do, do, are you okay taking one or two questions? From no, I'm okay. With okay. Taking okay. All right. So, so real quick. Um, oh, go ahead. Go. Non scientific question. So, Stefan, you've known me for like a quarter of a century. It's amazing. You've achieved the impossible. You, you took a research finding about the drug. You've developed it in now in humans. What's next? <laughs> uh, okay, what's next? Yes. Okay, we have something. So first of all, uh, uh, okay, science is still something I, I'd like. What um, the scientific wise, what we are now strongly following is a point of care essay for Delta. So we've developed that essay. Uh, recognizing all delta antibodies from all genotypes to the, the novel antigen. We've done that in a lateral flow assay in a, in a dipstick format, and we are currently trying to get that certificated and, and everything. So, is that a new company or also? Uh, we will new? make that company, yeah, and we will, we will follow that in, in the future. Yeah. And the idea is also to then very strongly collaborate with the WHO or with, with, with people that. Can bring this diagnostic uh, 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 tool into those countries where you need to get better epidemiological data and also uh, 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 allow people to test finding themselves at low prices. Yeah. Yeah, just to we have to diagnose that um, that disease earlier because if you would have treatments in the future, you shouldn't wait until they come into the clinic and you detect Delta because they have a clinical. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you should also have them diagnosed early. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this this is one part that we I think we still are doing very much work on uh, on these other drugs where we look for cellular factors that are uh, in, involved, and um, also in the German Center of Infectious Research. And personally, I mean, I can say that here we I have a foundation now from part of the money that I got, and I try also to support public health issues that are important because that is automatically something that I've never thought it was, is that you may have a drug, everything is good, you like it, and then you see that the people don't have access or you have to improve other things. Right. And you can improve them more efficiently like you do than by just doing science, you have to change infrastructures, etc. This is now in, in the beginning, of course, but I hope that this uh, this involves now in the next future. Wonderful here. Yeah. Thank you. So why don't we just do one? Um, so for those who are joining us by Zoom, we will um, hope capture your questions. Yeah, we're sorry. No, we'll capture your questions and see if we can't get answers written down and then we can try and post the answers when we post the recording, but let's just do one. Um, so Stefan, are there any active plans to test PEG interferon and Mirkludex combo in HBV only patients? So non D. <laughs> yeah, that is my big wish. And then first of all, I mean, Gilead is now following the clinical uh, studies. And of course uh, I, I do everything to push exactly that strategy because I think this is crucial to do that in HPV mono infected patients and look whether you see that possible synergism in HPV mono infected patients. Um, we are thinking about making also investigate initiators trial in that direction or Gilead is really following that. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, but I think it's very important. It's the, the, the thing that you should do. Yeah. Great, thank you. There are a lot of, by the way, I say there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a shame because there are over 100 people online. Yeah, a lot of questions. Um, we'll, we'll get to them hopefully. Um, so everyone joining us by Zoom, thank you so much. And everyone joining us in person, we do have a reception outside. So please come and hang around. Um, I will say, I'd like to take a picture first. So would the past Blumberg recipients and the current leaders, uh, but Blumberg Prize recipients and the current and past leaders of the foundation. If we could just take two seconds to take a photo and then we can join everybody at the reception. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Urban. Um, it was a fabulous Thanks everyone for joining.